writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, horror, and mystery. And with me today is... Brad R. Cook. Um, I write a lot of steampunk. Uh, Iron Horseman will be coming out uh, in the next month or so. And uh, other than that, I'm president of St. Louis Writers Guild. Peter Green, uh, author of uh, Crimes of Design, a Patrick McKenna mystery, and Ben's War with the U.S. Marines, a World War II biography. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book illustrator and author of YA Fantasy. I'm Meredith Tate. I'm author of the speculative new adult book, Missing Pizzas, coming out in the spring and currently working on a YA sci-fi. I'm Melanie Colaney, um, a writer of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. And with us today, we have a very special guest. I'm going to let him introduce himself. We have award-winning author... My name is Rick Squiat, and my most recent book is Fail, a mystery set in St. Louis. Excellent. Hooray, St. Louis. <laughs> and Fail is available already as this recording is being broadcast. You can find it in bookstores or Amazon or Barnes & Noble, correct? I'm looking over at the publisher who's nodding his head. <laughs> okay, and today our talk is going to be about setting as character. What is setting? And I know, Rick, one of the reasons why Fail is published with, um, is it Blank Slate? Blank Slate Press. Blank Slate Press. Your setting is St. Louis. Yes. And some of the New York people were like, oh, who cares about St. Louis? Yeah, hey, you know, St. Louis, we fly over them. <laughs> so yes. why did you choose St. Louis? I'm going to start off with you. Why St. Louis? Well, for one thing, I know St. Louis real well because I was born here and lived most of my life uh, in St. Louis, though I'm, though I'm elsewhere now. Um uh, and so I know know the city, and I know the culture, and um, also it has a lot of things about it that makes for great material, like uh, ongoing corruption and a failed school system and crime in the streets and uh, murder capital title, which we trade between Detroit and New Orleans every couple of years. So I had all those great things working for me to write a mystery. And plus we've got other things here, such as the history uh, there's a lot of racial elements in the book, so we've got the Dred Scott decision, and we've got the Mississippi, we've got Huck Finn, and all this other stuff that is uh, wonderful material for a writer. Um, sadly, we've got maybe too much for a crime <laughs> novelist. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're probably right on that. So, to everybody, how do you, is setting a character in your stories, how do you develop setting? Is it, go for it. Sorry. Um, you know, you put the R on, no, go for it. <laughs> um, well, my, one of my favorite genres, actually, to read and to write is dystopian, and I find that setting is a huge character in dystopian books because it's essentially the, the starting point for the entire story is what's going on in this dystopian society. Okay, and we do have two of our right pack people who came in after we got started. Hi, I'm Matt. Sorry I'm late. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Kathleen. Sorry I'm late. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, this is, I don't know if this is a bit out of topic or nothing, but uh, Go for it. just talking about uh, St. Louis being flyover, well, a lot of stuff is set in Chicago, and somehow that escapes being part of the Midwest in the eyes of East Coast publishers somehow. Um, like that the, might uh, be. Organized crime, most likely. <laughs> well, yeah. a bit too big of a city. You know, if it's a big enough city... They'll let it not be the Midwest. Also, too, Chicago is... I don't know. This is me guessing as to a reason why. Chicago is a entry port into the United States. It's if you fly in. Yes, yeah, an international as airport. International well, airport. So does St. Louis. In no, fact- we're not an entry point. We are not an entry point. Not you anymore. do not land... Not anymore. You don't land in St. Louis coming from, say, London, France, wherever. And you don't have the passport people... Checking your passport as you're coming into St. Louis. 
and any, any longer. Longer. Any, any longer. Any longer. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, one more comment to make is that I recently did a blog entry of a review of the book The Art of Laney by Paula Stokes. Um, and one thing I mentioned that I liked about that book was that it was based in St. Louis. And what a few people mentioned in comments of the review was that that was actually why they sought out the book, because they're so used to seeing books based in New York and L.A. And so I think that setting sometimes as a as a unique place that a lot of people don't know about can act as a, a drawing point for your story. And, you know, we St. Louis actually is a major uh, refugee center. Mm. Well, I mean, not the only one, certainly, but... We are. There's not really... Like uh, Dave pointed out, it's no longer an entry point by air, and we are in the middle of the country, but if you want to write an international story, it's actually not too hard to realistically set it in St. Louis, too. You know, uh, setting... I picked uh, St. Louis as setting for Crimes of Design first because I've lived here for uh, a lot of my adult life, but uh, also because the it, it's a town dominated by rivers, not just the Mississippi, but the Missouri flows into it just above St. Louis, and the uh, Merrimack comes along south of it. And the the rivers determine a lot of what we do, including development of the floodplain on the near side of the river, uh, and and it broods. It 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 it's such it becomes a character. If I may quote from Rick's new novel, Fail. Please. Uh, <laughs> Rick, Rick won't stop you. Uh, here Gabriel played at river pirates as a child and watched riverboats ply the swirling brown waters, which flow like milk chocolate here after the muddy Missouri joins it at the north, northernmost city limits. Uh, and it's where the, uh, Gabriel meets the story's climax. Uh, on a deserted riverbank, so so the mood uh, of the river is is acting upon everybody in the story. I'm glad you. I'm glad the way you brought that up, because let me ask this question to everybody: How does your setting affect the mood of the story of the characters, or does it? If I could say say something just as a basis here, then I'd have. Uh, taught creative writing here and there, and uh, mm -hmm. Pete uh, knows, because he, uh, I worked with Pete at Washington University when I was teaching there. And one of the things I always tell my students is that setting de determines character, and character determines plot. So everything springs from center, s setting. And no matter what character you have, whether, well, for Huck Finn, for example, uh, is completely determined, his character is completely determined by his being born on the wrong side of the tracks, although there probably were no tracks in Hannibal in those days. <laughs> but uh, being on the wrong side of the city and being in lower uh, working class and uh, being the son of an alcoholic father and then the river and everything else, you know, not only the, the geographic setting, but the psychological setting, the milieu, milieu and all that determined mm -hmm. who he was. And then his actions were determined, the plot was determined. Uh, would send him down river because of who he was. So it all springs from um, setting. Yeah, I was thinking in uh, dystopians, its setting also includes almost always government, because I've noticed in most, but not quite all dystopians, the dystopian element, if anything, is the government even more than the environment. Occasionally it's just the environment, but almost always. It's either no government or oppressive government. <laughs> well, one of the books I'm currently working on, I'm working on two. Um, the setting, it's based on St. Louis, but it's not in St. Louis. Um, I've actually taken what's called a um, O'Neill cylinder, which is a picture in your head, it's set in space. This <laughs> long cylinder that is literally 20 miles wide, 5 miles long. That's based on the real science. On the inside, if I've done the math right, you can take St. Louis County, not the St. Louis City itself, but St. Louis County, and put it on the inside. That's and that changes not only how the characters act and feel, because you get the you get the town, you get the feel of the town of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. But imagine walking around outside, looking up at the sky, seeing the beautiful clouds, and beyond those beautiful clouds, you see the other part of the city. It's aimed straight down at you. And how murder and crime occurs in that type of setting, and how it affects the characters. Makes shooting into the air really dangerous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and spitting. 
depending yeah. on how they're grabbing. You're well, really spinning good spinner if you can get yeah. up yeah. in the sky. I don't think you're going to get that kind of exit velocity. <laughs> oh, I can yeah, you can take, it's going to take a good eight force. miles of spit range to even hit zero gravity to get to the other side. I bet okay. you could do it. So I could. Still Jack Dawson could face. do it. Yeah, okay. it's so Aww. sad for me. <laughs> Makes witnesses dangerous, though. You wouldn't want to kill anyone outside. So Rick was talking about it, how the setting hits the, um, hits the characters psychologically, or if it develop, characters develop out of it. I, I'm sorry. Got distracted. Uh-huh. What about your settings? How, how do your characters... Or what, what do you think is important about the psychology of a setting? Go for it. Uh, well, I, I mention every week that I write fantasy. I don't have any fantasies published currently to show off, but the fantasy that I've been working on most prevalently through most of my life, I had to develop you know, the world that it lived in. I wasn't, I'm not pulling from a, an ancient earth sort of situation. I tried to develop my own culture with my own religious background and my own creation myth, and it makes me, doing that, I always thought back to Tolkien, Tolkien did that with Middle Earth, that Mm -hmm. he created a a pantheon of deities and how they interact with the different races, and those things funneled into his characters at a basic level, even before we get to a single named person who says lines. Like, the entire culture of dwarves are based on this idea that they weren't wanted. Like, they were moved underground because none of the other gods wanted them around. This one god made them because he felt like he wanted to make things. (laughs) So, coming up with a a setting and having it be a character, that's like thinking about the ancestry of every character in your book. Like, where's everyone springing from? And it takes a lot of work, too. Anyone who's built a world knows that you you start from, like, a a pancake foundation and it just builds up from there. As uh, As a history, historical fantasy author, and more importantly, a steampunk author, I have to completely agree with what Rick was saying in the sense that for me, especially with steampunk, everything comes out of setting. I mean, the Victorian age is one thing, but all the brass, all the leather, all the gears, all the, you know, the steam. I mean, that's the core of any steampunk novel. And then you move out from there and you, you know, branch out into different ways. And then you find your juxtaposition that you're looking for, whether it's technology versus biological or whatever. But it all stems from the setting of that steampunk universe. But, uh... I think, on the other hand, you can't get too far away with your setting just being a setting. Uh, it It's going to influence a lot of your character's conflicts, and so you need a setting that builds into the things you're trying to do with the characters. Like, uh, the example I think of is, like, The Scarlet Letter. You know, it's just like a story about forbidden love and shame and trying to overcome it and exile and all that kind of thing. You couldn't set it in the modern day, though, because then the story would just be... Hey, I'm going to quit the ministry and let's go out. Well, okay. Actually, you could, but it would be a different story because the setting, the, the character of setting would change. But for instance, um, different. I don't know if anyone's tried to do that. If anyone wants to try and rewrite Scarlet Letter in present day, hey, great romantic literary project. Good luck. But, um, <laughs> I'm sure there's a Lifetime movie that's already done that. The movie they EZA thought. kind of did like a satire <laughs> yeah, they tried on to it. Do yeah. But yeah. Um, the point is someone did reset, reset uh, Pride and Prejudice in the modern day, but they did it in modern day India, which when you think about it works much better than modern day America. And mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. I it was a Bollywood movie. It opened in America and I did see it. It was quite a while ago. Um there were parts of it I liked. The story itself worked. I had some issues with just plain old some of the Bollywood conventions threw me, but they were Bollywood did, conventions. Did the setting change the way it was told at all, or? Well, yeah, because um, in Pride and Prejudice, uh, the mother, oh. the mother's goal was to get her daughters married, because her daughter's financial security and all that was all around, you know, a woman's security was being well married. Well, in modern day India, yeah. Same thing. Um, her mother was trying to find, you know, arrange good marriages for her daughters. Now, if they were a little bit different, uh, I think they might have eliminated one of the daughters, so it was only four daughters in the Indian version, just to simplify the story. This was a movie. And the other thing they did differently, the character with Kitty, who, who ran away with the American, not American. A soldier. Well. The rake. Yeah. In Pride and Prejudice, Kitty ran away with Mr. Wickham. Okay. 
the character of Mr. Wickham in the Bollywood version was an American. That's the confusion in my head. But point is, she ran away with them. They tracked her down. Well, in Pride and Prejudice, in that time period, Mr. Darcy tracked them down and pressured Mr. Wickham to marry Kitty. Well, in the Bollywood version, Mr. Darcy helped track him down and rescued Kitty and brought Kitty back to her family where she was lovingly accepted back into the family. Mm -hmm. So he had a cultural difference because of the setting. That was, I'm not sure if it was, that wasn't just a cultural difference. In fact, if anything, I think that was a modernism difference. Okay. I'm a bit confused about what you meant by psychological setting and how that differs from character. Okay. Because I'm hearing a few different kinds of setting, like cultural setting for one. Mm -hmm. So where's the line? Um... My understanding of set setting is everything, uh, the ge geography of the uh, place, the culture, uh, and the whole world of the novel that the characters are set in. Okay, so that that would include uh, the mores of the culture, their family situation, their physical situation, all these uh, tangible things that are not necessarily tangible, realistic things that affect development of the character. So I'm, my, my view of it is a very, very broad one. So that's what you meant by um, Huck Finn growing up on the wrong side of the tracks and um, having an alcoholic father. Those are part of his setting because yes. those are influenced right. by his culture. Right, right. And, yeah. okay. I was just thinking about this. Um, in modern day, um, if you were going to have two 15-year-olds go out on a date, like go out to the movies, that would mean dramatically different things if the setting was New York. Or even, okay, let's both have them in New York. New York with uh, families that have lived in the U.S. for a long time and, you know, third-generation Americans versus uh, recent immigrants and the families were devout Muslims. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. radical differences in what that meant to the story. True. Real quick, let me throw this out to you guys. Hmm. Um, so this is uh, from an article written in uh, Writer's Digest. Uh, and this quote directly is coming from Donald Mass. Uh, so, in great fiction, uh, the setting lives from the very first pages. Such places not only feel extremely real, they are dynamic, they change, they affect the characters in the story, they become metaphors, possibly even actors in the drama. Powerfully betrayed, setting seems to have a life of their own. But how is that effect achieved? Make your setting a character is a common piece of advice given to fiction writers, yet beyond invoking all five senses when describing the scenery, there's not a lot out there uh, about exactly how to do it. So, and then yeah. if you want, uh, there's a great link, actually. It's uh, a huge thing about how you can do it by linking details and emotions, uh, measuring change over time, realizing that history is personal. Uh, we all experience it personally. Uh, see that setting through the character's eyes, not necessarily through your eyes. There's a bunch more. Yeah, that was mm. reminding me in a lot of stories, you have the outsider character come in. So by an outsider character coming in, you have an excuse to explain your setting to the reader as the character is learning about it. Harry Potter learned a lot of strange things when he realized he was a wizard. Yeah. That was my first thought. Sure. Um, but if you don't want to have, like, an outsider character, which, you know, it's the Well, it doesn't have to, to be do, the main but, character. Well, not even necessarily the main, but if you didn't want to do that, how mm -hmm. would you go about it? You know, how do you yeah. explain in piecemeal how your setting yeah. works? I'm working on that right now. Exposition couch. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's stop not it with the mean. literary techniques. Ah. If I uh, may return to St. Louis briefly, uh, it, we have an unusual... Um, uh, man versus nature is always a big theme, and uh, nature certainly includes the setting. Uh, but in St. Louis, we have a, a unique relationship in the man versus nature equation because, because of the confinement of the city by the rivers and the fact that the floodplains on the near side are the only land available for new development in many cases, uh, especially industrial and commercial, uh, uh, the development of the floodplain uh, it, it, it requires that you conquer nature with levees and drainage systems to clear the rain out of the pr protected area. So, and and that since it is man-made, uh, uh, 
it can be man destroyed. So that adds a, a real element of uh, of noir conf- conflict into the whole thing. Agreed. Um, in answer to the general question, how do you develop this? I think one thing that most of us do as writers, and we probably, if we don't do it consciously, we're still doing it subconsciously or part of our learned craft. That this, this the setting is defined by the conflict that the characters come in in touch with. So. If it's the Scarlet Letter, uh, then uh, Hester is that her name? I think so. Hester, mm-hmm. yes. yeah. Hester Prince. Yeah, yeah, she, you know, is running into this uh, uh, approbation from the community and whatnot. So she's running up against that. There's that conflict, or, or in what whatever work it, it might be in Pride or Prejudice, your characters are running up against conventions and, and uh, class strictures and that kind of stuff. So when you start bumping up against these things, you start defining what the what the setting is. Okay, because it's it's out of conflict. We all we all want to write have a lot of conflict in our writing. We want to be mm-hmm. doing that. So, you know, those those I think that's the common way that the setting starts taking shape is that whether it's a, the flood is coming, you know, mm-hmm. or or the, the stranger comes to town or whatever it is, you know, that's you start having this, this this conflict. So that enables us as writers to start defining what the limits are in terms of. Yeah. There's this whole, I don't know if it's a genre or just a description, but it's called a comedy of manners. A lot of, some stories are comedy of manners, and that's all about bumping up against social convention. Mm-hmm. 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 <clears throat> well, I think also, too, oh, go ahead. No, you can go on. It's I'll say with the setting, going with social, I'm going to go with that first. Take a look at St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Very few people, Very St. Louis, for those outside of St. Louis, yes, we have our problems. <laughs> I'll I'll be the first to throw that in. Everywhere it does. We though. yeah, everywhere it does. St. Louis is still it's a northern it's a southern city with a northern aspect or however you want to take that. We're kind of in the, in the middle. We have some self segregated areas, lack of a better way of saying that. We have segregated areas. We regardless if we want to admit to it or not, it exists. And we're, we've gotten a lot better. I think, in the long run. However, what I find really interesting as a St. Louisan, trying to look at it, even though I'm an insider, trying to look at it from an outside point of view, is how is how rare anybody who lives up in North St. Louis County will ever go down to South St. Louis County, or even to Central County. How, many, how rare it is for a South St. Louis County person to go up to North St. Louis. And growing up, my parents had a joke about you need your passport mm-hmm. to go into the other counties. And my grandparent, my godparents lived in a different county, a different part of the county than we did. It's just that whole aspect, you get a feel if you drive around St. Louis, if you drive around all the county areas, you almost see a character change as you drive from county to county to county, or down, town to town to town inside the county. That's what I, I mean. I think to that say. applies for. Um... Just any kind of traveling you do. I agree. When you when you drive through a place or you walk through um, a town or a shopping area mm-hmm. or a park, there are mm-hmm. different sort of people than you're used to at home, and that helps kind of put both places into perspective. Yeah. Perspective. In fact, um, oh, back in 2005, I traveled to England, and I promptly got lost inside of London, looking, trying to find where I'm at. And I whipped out my camera because I literally found... Eight different types of architecture in the same block. Mm-hmm. Or at least mm-hmm. where I could just capture with my camera. Mm-hmm. And it's just because that was a really alien aspect to it. That just they captured me as a writer that I wanted to have it as a memento to remember to write, be able to write something about it. So uh, how it developed over time too. Uh-huh, exactly. Uh, you, in one shot, you could you could do uh, eight hundred years of history probably in London. Exactly. I like a. Uh, oh, you know. No, 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 it's fine. Go ahead. I, <laughs> I forgot about talk you. About underground cities. So. Ooh, that's another interesting topic. We don't have so many of those here. So many what? of those? How many does a normal place usually have? I think we've got like. I think there's an un- underground set of tunnels or things were sunk in in Seattle. Uh-huh. As far as I know. The problem is we have a pretty high water table. It kind of limits the amount of underground stuff we have. But yeah. we have a lot of caves in Missouri. Portland's got a great underground section. Uh, there are parts mm-hmm. of the west uh, where there's been some great underground digging. You, you get all the government stuff, so you get all the great government facilities that have been put underground. Um, but if you're looking for true cultures, 
um, you got to go over to Turkey, or where uh, they had the whole culture that lived. Didn't they mm-hmm. lived above, but they had built huge structures underneath. Uh, so in times of trouble, they could go under. Um, also, right here in St. Lucia, have an underground culture of the homeless people yes. living in the uh, yes. old railroad tunnels downtown. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And, um, an interesting kind of not underground city, but um, in 2011, I went to Denmark, and in Copenhagen, there's this tiny little part called Christiania. It's technically illegal, but it's kind mm-hmm. of this tented anarchist village that for whatever reason like it exists there not very legally but again they have their own boundaries they make their own laws even though they exist within Copenhagen and we walked through it and it's like walking into a different country and it is just such a strange place I, I really want to read a book based in Christianity if anyone has one <laughs> let me know real quick two, uh, two underground cities I can think of one was already mentioned Portland mm-hmm. if I remember my criminology correctly or criminal timeline this has recently, like within the last couple of years, been stopped. But the underground city, which still existed, even though it had been technically abandoned, was still being used by, or by, I'm going to use like a word, organized crime for prostitution and so forth. We're here underneath the city. Chicago. Chicago. Um, also, the other one I'm thinking of is Budapest in Romania, where this, the cops have actually captured a... I'm trying to remember his age. I'm going to call him 22. He's almost too old to live in the underground. Um, Where he's basically plays a role of a father for all these lost kids that have ended up in Romania. It's underground. Once again, unfortunately, he he tries to protect them from prostitution. He also controls controls the drug supply there. He's got AIDS, which is why they've yanked him away. But there's still a whole entire underground culture around these homeless kids that exists underneath the city. You and then you. Uh, well, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about all this history and, like, different architectures and having cities under cities is that uh, they give a sense to your setting that there it used to be one way and now it's a different way and it has its own kind of history behind it. It's like a... It is like an example of writing a setting like a character where it has a backstory and it's been through a couple things and it's changed since it started. And uh, that's probably... It's a it's a good thing to look for in your setting to see if it's bigger... Even if you're trying to focus on your characters, if it's bigger than your characters. It has stuff going on there that doesn't relate to your characters necessarily. It's bigger than them. And just to add to that, I think it also can show the secret side. You think you you know the city, and now here's your other side of it. Go ahead. I think it also helps um, bring out character, though, mm-hmm. knowing, well, if we're seeing from one character's perspective what they notice and what they don't, what parts of the city or country, wherever they are, what parts of the area they see and what parts are closed to them, whether or not they notice those things. Um, are pretty telling about character too. There's a there's an Atlanta underground, of course, which has become a uh, like a, it's been a hippie and then later yuppie a place for entertainment entertainment district, which is protected from the extremes of weather, mm-hmm. but, uh, and that's a very modern. But back in the uh, uh, 1800s in Chicago, uh, the city had a a soils problem and foundations would tend to sink in the ground so what they figured out the engineers figured out a way to do a uh, a sub uh, a substructure under the downtown area which supported a big slab where all the streets were paved and everything but down below in what they called the underworld does that ring a bell <laughs> uh, right, all manner it, it, early writers described it's series of tunnels, sharp turns, uh, hidden grottos, uh, uh, concealed all manner of thieves, pickpockets, kidnappers, pimps, prostitutes, uh, and in all forms of desperation. Uh, as as smarter and smarter people uh, learned how to master all those uh, all of those uh, criminal activities. Uh, Chicago's underworld developed into a huge network, which we read about yet today. Go ahead. I'm going to toss out two questions. I was going to throw out Edinburgh did the same thing, practically. Mm -hmm. Uh, Edinburgh, 
was uh, narrow streets, very, very narrow. It was confined by its city walls and stuff like that. So when they decided to build it modern, they literally just paved over a huge swatch of it, leveled it out, and that created a huge underground section of the city that was the old city of Edinburgh. So, Real quick, there's a couple aspects to the setting. Oh, which, by the way, right. real quick, just to throw out, that is the setting of Jekyll and Hyde. And makes mm-hmm. a beautiful, beautiful backdrop that he set Jekyll and Hyde against. Sorry, just wanted to throw that. That's fine. One of my favorite stories. Um, in a setting, we talk about character itself, but you've got man-made things, you've got nature, you have weather, um, which is part of nature, but I'm trying to break that away from, say, mountains or lakes, rivers, so forth. How do you avoid... In your creation of your setting as a character, how do you avoid the tropes? Well, want to list the tropes first? No, I don't. I want to, I want to play with that. <laughs> mm. There'll be a lot of them anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I kind of try is, uh, uh, I try realism. Well, I mean, because I, I find it's a, it's a good like benchmark um, to kind of check your ideas, like what you imagine would be great against uh, what would actually work out. Like, uh, imagine you want to write a city about, like, a... Or write a story about a city that has a castle in it. Okay. Like a big castle city. And you decide to set it out in the middle of a field, and there's nothing around for a long while. And you're like, oh, this is great. And then, uh, if you tried to check yourself against history, though, you'd see that most cities are built next to, like, rivers or bodies of water. And especially castles, you know, that are there to defend particular points. So you'd be like, oh, that's not a great idea. But that's like kind of like a Gondor city. Is mm-hmm. It's just, you know, up in a field somewhere. True. Definitely. I was going to ask if there are any story problems you've run into that have been solvable through setting changes. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll throw this out. I don't know if I've personally run into it because I tend to be more of a uh, plotter than a pantser. But examples would be of like... You've got two people who are in the middle of an argument. How does that argument change depending upon whether they're sitting in their living room, Mm -hmm. sitting in a crowded restaurant, sitting in, you know, a public park or something like that? The setting right there will infinitely change the, you know, the way that conversation will unfold, what will happen within it. So it's not a direct answer, but I think setting changes can easily change out your story. But um, in... Direct answer to your, your question. I come across problems like that as I write, where where uh, the setting's not serving my purposes, and given my, my broad definition of setting, so I'll find that I have characters who aren't doing, who don't have the proper motivation, you know, have, uh, for what they're doing, their proper background. So I start changing the background, you know. So if the person maybe I make them, give them a different aspect to their to their family, or a different place where they came from, or a different neighborhood. Or give them a parent who was an alcoholic, or um, a, a brother who was a murderer, or something. Whatever I need, so I start going back and changing the conditions of the setting in order to get to certain to to proper motivation for that character or proper action. And it, I'm talking about psychological stuff here, but it could be other physical things too. You know, but the history of the character and, and the place. Uh, just. Talking about setting affecting story just made me think about horror stories. And in a whole lot of horror stories, isolation is key. And today we're always connected. So one of the first things authors have to do is get their characters disconnected, which leads to the trope that I know I heard somewhere else. The cell phone always dies first. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I found I had to do that in, mm-hmm. in my newest mystery, Fatal Designs. No signal. No yeah. signal. One of the things I do, it's very similar to what Rick was talking about. I look at it from a Hitchcockian point of view, and which I've written a lot of blogs on writing Hitchcockian, is I take it back to the psychology of id, ego, and superego. And I realize my setting has its own id, ego, and superego, as well as how the characters see it as such. In other words, the id is the world of desire, if you will. Ego, the world of as it really is, and the superego is running in between back and forth. Between that. And so I take it and I look at, okay, I've got a character. He's not super motivated. Why? Well, maybe I'm not really hitting his id. 
or making the ego and the id argue with each other over what they want. Or, I'm not saying enough fear in the character. Let me, I'm going to use some Hitchcock for a moment. Vertigo. One of my, one of my favorite stories, um, movies. The main character is afraid of heights because he loses a, he loses a, initially a, another cop, I'm trying to remember if it was his partner or not, goes off the side of a building and down to, down to his death. And that just sends him, sends the character off. Um, so height plays a big part throughout the story as a setting aspect. And it, and it changes the position of that character. Another one, uh, Spellbound. Spellbound was a character, in there was a character who had amnesia. Anything with lines would set him off, cause him to have this neur- neur- neurosis, like what Barbara was saying. This. And it was a play on those lines. It could be a lines inside of a person's robe or on their shirt. It could be shadows. It could be, as we learn later, one, one of the reasons why is um, ski tracks. Another one is, um, say, on a fence. The metal fences that people would have around their houses with little sharp points at the top. That shadow from that could cause him to go and break away from where he was. And you suddenly get a sense of suspense. So it's one of the tricks I've learned. Um, Yeah, I kind of lost track of the original question. We were talking about uh, trying to subvert tropes. Identifying well, was, tropes, yeah, and then it kind of went in a snake way. Yeah. So, um, I think having setting his character is hard for some people to put their brain around. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to put my brain around because I rely so heavily on my characters for stories. But I need to because I have a fantasy land, so I need to have it be present. But the um, I think the most important way I use setting is using it to inform my characters based on what they notice. Like, your main character, even if it's not written from first person, your main character is the eyes and ears of the audience. So, when your main character walks into the city, as an author, you need to know everything about it. But whether your main character notices that there are children playing with puppies, or notices that there's a mugging going on, will tell you where your your main character's focus lies. Are they blind to the bad things of the city because they didn't see the mugging? Instead, they were focusing on the puppy. Or were they able to see past the puppy and notice that there was corruption going on on the street that they were on? And that can be in a fantasy world or a real-life world. I'm sure uh, St. Louis as a location has a lot of that because we all experience a lot of that here living in this city, whether we're seeing what's actually going on or what we want to see. Agreed. Go ahead. Um, I think going off of settings and how they influence character is very important, but I kind of agree with how it can sometimes influence tropes, and that um, thinking about like somebody who grew up in New York City is going to be very different than someone who grew up in rural Iowa, or I'm from in New Hampshire, or um, like India, or whatever, but I think that that can also lead to kind of stereotypes in your characters, like um, the kid who grew up on the streets with the drunk parents in some slum or like the backwoods hillbilly who grew up in the northern mountains or something and I feel like that's kind of gets kind of tropey and it's important to while your setting can influence your character they also don't have to be all based on the stereotypes of that setting and that background Agreed. so inform and not define mm. sometimes the setting uh, can can have a, a, a mood uh, like a uh, in Fatal Designs, which I'm trying to finish up right now, uh, an earthquake uh, is the inciting incident for the plot. And uh, it, it separates Erin from her canoeing party and gets her cell phone wet, as we said. And uh, it also, Patrick feels almost that uh, the earth is trying to uh, defeat him in some way. He feels mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, the setting had is is his adversary in this particular book. So re, so it's reflecting on the characters. Yes. Would tone be considered part of setting? Well, like think, yeah. I would claim yes. Tone and mood, yeah. Because the tone of the setting, the mood, well yeah, more more on mood on the setting, but 
I think the tone of this thing does either reflect the character, reflect the story, reflect the, or might reflect the, how do I put this? I can't think of a good phrase for it, so let me, you get, you get somebody who is a sugar candy type character, all the world is great, and if you're writing it from a third person point of view, not from his not from his first person you get this character he's walking down the streets and next thing you know he's walking past a homeless guy who is laying on an air vent outside of a shopping mall to get heat and so you get that will contrast what this character's seeing I don't know if I answered your question go for it well you, you can certainly see different moods in the same settings if you look at some of the, the English novelists I mean Th- Thomas Hardy and and uh, Fielding and the Bronte sisters and Jane Austen use the same general geographic settings, but the mood's entirely different in their work. Some of it's very light, some of it's very dark. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I think mood is certainly part of the part of the setting, and uh, which you know, the author can can develop in you know, any number of ways. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, if you want to run into the cliches. Um, Romance writing is actually a good place to go because, frankly, there it's sort of like the same story and the same characters are plopped into a whole bunch of different settings. And, I mean, it's usually not, well, sometimes it is the same author doing it, but sometimes it's different authors. And it's not all romances, but there are romances like that, and they're easy to find. I'm glad that you made the point that it was not all romances. Yes. Because it would have been on. It would have been on. <laughs> no, there are is, is that for me romance, romance just, part of writer and you? <laughs> I have so many friends, yeah. and I love romance. It just has to be done well. Stuff mm-hmm. that's not done well, feel free to like poke holes yeah. in it all you want. Mm-hmm. Just but there are also conventions that are to get a romance published. You have to follow certain rules if you want it published by okay, a certain author. Let's we'll stick by. on setting. Stick on setting. Yeah, we'll yeah. talk about stick romance on setting. Romance day. and other genres. <laughs> Speaking of awesome things, though, yeah. which some romance is, mm-hmm. what are some of the best settings you guys have encountered? Like, the immersive ones that make you just want to go crawl up and live there. Hmm. Well, that think... lone scary house sitting up on top of the yeah. hill that, with the one. shutter hanging <laughs> off. Good setting. Yeah. Yeah. You can put all kinds of stuff in that house. Actually, I, I really find uh, sci-fi books in general have some of the best settings because mm-hmm. they're, especially if they're not set in modern day, it's created a whole world you can go visit. Fantasy, some too. Let's go geeky for a moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just... For a moment? <laughs> we, we've, we've actually gone less than we have normally, so I need I've to throw I've been geeky this whole time. <laughs> Good. Let's take a look at Gotham City. Gotham. Good, you know, good I mean, weren't we already looking at that? It was called Chicago. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> should, we talked about New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but, but okay, as it was. And actually, right now I'm reading on the side Raymond Benson's series. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this one called The Black Stiletto. The Black Stiletto. Roy, give you a quick brief, and I want to go back to setting how this affects. It's a story told two ways. It's always told by diary, for the most part. It's told in the 1950s and eventually into the 60s as a diary of a woman who became what we would call a superhero, known as the Black Stiletto. It's told also by a diary of her son, modern day, who is a caretaker now of this woman who he never knew anything about this. And he's now just discovered her diaries as she has Alzheimer's and is in an old folks home. And he's having to try and deflect stuff. And think the modern day and the past always tie up somewhere together. But one of the interesting things, this happens, all the stories that take place in New York, as far as any type of hero type stories, be it Spider-Man, be it Superman, be it you name it, the characters are able to jump from building to building very easily. They're all there. It's almost like a modern jungle made out of buildings. I know that's a, that's a trope right there. Mm-hmm. Okay, I take that same idea and I put it here in St. Louis. How easy is it for anybody to go jumping from high tower to high tower to the house? Well, it's because we're part of the city here. Yep. You're going to run out Bingo. of towers pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, you are going to run out of towers pretty quick. It, it's much more difficult. 
I mean, if you're trying to do that in the suburbs, you got to jump really far. <laughs> yeah. If you're trying to do that in downtown, then you still have a far jump because our if you're able to do it, to be sparsed out a little bit more. If you're able to do it in St. Louis, get rid of your costume and join the Olympics. We need you on the long jump team. <laughs> Set your building height standards lower. Yeah, I hope they're not lower. trying to cover the counties too. Yeah, well, that'd be pretty hard. I was I was just thinking about that the. Um, the different tropes, like for instance, mm-hmm. uh, if you want to give your character a job, like a dog walker, mm-hmm. guess what? St. Louis does have some dog walkers, but they make a whole lot less money than dog walkers do in big cities because, one, fewer people need them because a whole lot more people have yards, and two, the dogs live further apart. <laughs> True. <laughs> so. How do you avoid, going back to tropes, I know, I just want to kind of jump back to that, then I want to ask another question. How do you avoid some of the tropes? Like, you're having a big argument. I'm going to use Brad for a moment. Brad's argument question. You have a big argument between two of your main characters. And I'm going to be tropey. Thunder and lightning's occurring in the background. Or you got big noise in the background. How do you... What, what, how, what do you do? Do you, do you ever catch yourself doing it? Where the, um, the weather reflects the mood of the characters. Uh-huh. I was having such a bad day. So now you got thunder and lightning storm coming on top of you. No, no, just this oppressive rain. Because, of course, it would rain because I'm having a bad day. Mm -hmm. No, make it sunny. The sun's mocking you. (laughs) Yeah. Well, of course, are you having this argument because you're stuck with people in a storm shelter? (laughs) Yeah, that's how My Fire Lady starts. And and that forces people together that might never have met otherwise. Uh, They're stuck waiting for cabs in the rain. Oh, or that bomb shelter would be interesting. Yeah, it reminds me of the, well, Red Mask of Death by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Poe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Frank. Yeah. A family conv- confined in this special world which cannot be exited. And I'm going to take this and bat the ball straight to our special guest. Having read Fail and what you wrote, the story you wrote, as a writer, how did you work around that? Because you... you I noticed that you used the setting quite well, the weather quite well, yeah. and I don't want to give anything away, but <laughs> <laughs> you were able to avoid the tropes. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing I did, I, I, I chose to set it in uh, wintertime with the snow, and so that was sort of a constant thing, and you can use that in many different ways, whether it's the sun shining or it's slushy or it's mm-hmm. you know blowing in and that, so, and plus it has all sorts of inherent difficulties, which, you know, like car sliding the ditches and stuff which which you know does does strand the characters at one one point because of of a storm coming in off the uh, plains um you know i think in in doing whatever aspect of setting whether it's the weather whatever else or even describing a room what i always strive to do is to not describe the room but just just the setting just describe in what way it is unlike any other place you know, you know, not how this room is like other rooms, or how that character is like other characters, how they're different. And usually, it just would take one, one particular de- detail, because we we all know what a doctor's office looks like. Mm-hmm. But you know, let's uh, put a uh, you know a stuffed marmot in it or something, and whatever, <laughs> yeah. whatever the one distinguishing characteristic would be to to let us understand what the character is like, who who runs the place. Uh, there was a speaker for the Writers Guild. I wish I could recall her name, but I'm terrible with names. You guys can probably help me. Keep um, going. We'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, she said a couple really helpful, just little kernels of thought to remember. Uh, they said, everyone knows that the sky is blue, the grass is green. Tell us when it's different. Mm-hmm. Because... Was that Whitley? Or... No, it wasn't Whitley. Okay. No. Long ago. I can, see, I can see the face, but I can't think of it. Yeah. Keep going. Huh. Well, that was all. Okay. That's all I'm sharing. You yeah. notice when the sky turns green, you start getting worried. Yeah, if, you, yeah. if you're in St. Louis and you see the sky turn green, run. <laughs> Find shelter. No, no then you fall down next to a wall and stick your butt in the air. <laughs> okay. That's what they trained us in school to do. Assume the, the position, the tornado position. See, yeah. I'm bad. Are you sure I that training was something else? And I start else. watching. <laughs> you say assume Slap. the position, and there is definitely a difference. I was like, Thank you. arresting someone. Yeah. <laughs> you went where I went. 
<laughs> By the way, speaking of a different setting, because I am of a different generation than you, but we did an atomic bomb drill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We the same oh. thing, where we had to get, get beneath our desk. desk and said, that's always going to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have my that. suspicions for the tornado yes. position as well. I think they made us do that just to laugh at us while we were down there. We Those actually, videos of the atomic drills are so cute. There's just, we, we did we did them in, while I was still in school, and okay. a friend who some of you have just recently met hmm. uh, <laughs> got himself into trouble. I'm leaving his name out of it by telling the teacher when the teacher said, "Okay, when, when this alarm goes off, what should you do?" He said, "Bend over and kiss my you know what goodbye." <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually. This is a kind of a good tangent to go off on, though. Yeah, go for tangent. Because I remember uh, I had a class on apocalyptic cinema that set during like the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. yeah. And part of what it was uh, that uh, era was about was the like ever present dread in the background mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. just complete nuclear apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Not even just you know America getting bombed or Russia mm -hmm. getting bombed, but the whole world going extinct. Yeah, Mutual the assured destruction. Mm -hmm. And it's that's that. a setting that, like, uh, you know, it gives a certain character to the world that you're in. Yeah, well, it affects the mood and everything. I colored yeah. our media on Earth for a very long time. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is one of the reasons why X-Men did really well, going back to that that time. And, and using that, because they, they, I mean, that's the world in which they play. And they play off that fear, that, that Cold War feel, fear that was there so well. And I think that's one of the reasons why the new X-Men movies did really well. I was going to mention uh, John Oliver, who in last week tonight, uh, weeks and weeks ago, did a piece on drones. And I was very surprised when um, a boy from the Middle East said, I hate blue skies. I'm afraid of them. Because then that's when the drones are out and you will never see it coming. And they like gray, rainy days because mm -hmm. they can go outside. They don't have to worry about things like that. And that was crazy. That was a, an aspect of setting I had never considered before. That would be an interesting aspect of it. Uh, that leads me to a question that perhaps a talking point. Uh, okay. What are some situations in which your own writing or other people's writing, you've noticed that the setting is written out of character? Mm. Or things that become... Let's say it, it messes with the tone because suddenly you suddenly you realize that the place you were isn't where you were it's expecting. You were. Yeah. yeah. Well, in one of Brad's short stories, and I, you'll tell me the name of it, <laughs> uh, it in the opening paragraph, uh, one of the characters is looking up in the sky and sees uh, two moons, and I said, "Oh, this story is going to be different." <laughs> Oh, I was, um, I don't think this disrupted the tone, but the set, the setting for me, um, it was a short story, sci-fi, but they, the, there was an obstetrician attending a birth, and they were birthing a baby that there was, you know, out of a, uh, he would, they were just, he, the author was describing in technical detail, sort of, not too technical, be, the baby being removed from this machine, uh -huh. and then he went and had a talk with another future father, and you just, and then again, that's the first clue. It's like, he's going to talk to the potential father, notice who's missing. Uh -huh. And then, um, you know, they go talk about, you know, there was a line, yeah, we can, we can uh, filter out some genetic defects along with uh, a, a, when we remove the defective X chromosome. Uh -huh. So, I mean, this is a clue. There's no women in this world. Mm -hmm. So that was the ways uh -huh. you get setting to describe and until... And there was another line right after that that you know the doctor hurried on before the a patient or a patron made the next logical conclusion. Well, we as the reader had no idea what the next logical conclusion was. Yeah. So this was just all establishing. But we setting. were clued into the condition. Yeah. And that happens. I don't know if this is the story you're talking about, but T. W. Findlay's Zero Time uh, has a defective X chromosome, and they have to. Completely different people. story. Hers was Import a defective people. Y chromosome. Y chromosome. So it's yeah. a different story, but similar idea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the men were sterile. Mm -hmm. Is what it came. No, to. see, in this in this story, this was oh, what was the name of it? Don't remember it, but the point was uh, they were purposely not having women in this world. I think I was leaning more toward like um, you're reading a story mm -hmm. and. 
you go to uh, the the main character goes to Egypt, mm-hmm. and at the minute they land on the coast, they look up and see the pyramids. And it's obvious that this person has never been to Egypt. Oh, he doesn't, when they screwed it up. Oh, doesn't screwed realize up there. Yeah, that, okay. oh. that the pyramids are actually really far inland. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I have to admit to, and uh, doing research for my setting, is now I use things like Google Earth mm-hmm. yes. so I don't make those kind yeah. of mistakes. And when I was writing Fail, I had this scene that was taking place in the, the office of the mayor of the city of St. Louis. And I had been there years ago mm-hmm. for some occasion. But I couldn't quite remember what what the view was out the window, so I just went to Google Earth and found City Hall and went down the outside of it and looked out the mayor's window, and there was the War Memorial and the, and the library and the rest of it. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff really uh, has changed re- research and doing setting, because mm-hmm. you can put yourself down with street view and see what a street in London looks like, and you can't go time traveling too much, you know, <laughs> but you you can find out what things look like today. So yeah. That, yeah. that's a good tool. That's a, a good part of a, a good thing about research setting, mm-hmm. so, setting research. <laughs> um, Before I let you go, I'm going to answer real fast. And funny, she, the author here is a St. Louis author. I'm not going to name names. I'm not throwing people on the bus. But I think she used back then was um, MapQuest. Mm-hmm. To figure out how and how she was going to go from point to go from point A, point B, point C. I'm like, I know the back roads. Why didn't you? I could catch uh-huh. you off 30 minutes ahead of time. And that kind of threw me out of it. I have an example from a previous draft of a story um, wherein a character flips her phone shut when she's done with a call. We don't really do that anymore. No, <laughs> no. The flip phones are so last. No, year. wait a minute. Some people still have flip phones. That's just something so, important about the but, character if they have a flip phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. something to know. People. Yes. She wouldn't have been one of them. And I think Jen was the one that was like, she just flipped her phone shut. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just it's little, been a while. A little red circle. Might <laughs> be old. Oh, another example kind of of when MapQuest is useful is I was coming up of what Jen said about um, when the setting kind of gets it wrong is that I read a a CP's draft about a book taking place in London and the story started on Baker Street and I studied abroad right off of Baker (laughs) Street and the character then took three different buses to get to Oxford Street and Oxford Street is within walking distance from Baker Street Mm -hmm. so I was reading that and I was like I'm a little confused and she just didn't know because she hadn't looked it up but then we kind of talked about MapQuest and just yeah, and you should you missed my face. Unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately, this is not video, but you missed my face because I'm like, they did three bus blocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, even I was doing the same thing. I'm like, okay, wait, Baker Street, and they're, like, they're kind of close. <laughs> I was just going to throw out actually in Iron Horseman. Uh, we just went through this. Uh, so Iron Horseman starts out at Eden College, which is in Windsor, which nowadays is technically part of London because it's sitting, it's like mm-hmm. just outside London, so it's been kind of engrossed and pulled in to like the, what would be the London suburbs. But in the 1880s, it was a short carriage ride from, mm-hmm. you know, downtown London into Eton College and, you know, everything like that. It's one of the reasons why Windsor Castle was there. It was a getaway from, you know, Buckingham Palace. Nowadays, it's more like a going halfway across town kind of deal. Mm-hmm. But we had that exact same thing where the question was, do you start off saying it's in London or do you start off saying it was in Windsor? You know, we decided just to just go with London because... Yeah. yeah, only the British people who read this book are going to know. Okay. Uh, one of the problems that, that I've, I've I've had in the in my uh, in fail when I, my most recent book in writing it, uh, one of the problems I had with setting was uh, making sure that things haven't changed uh, mm-hmm. because things change so mm-hmm. fast these mm-hmm. days and um, technology changes so fast and there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, electronic sleuthing going on in the book you know with computers and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I was really concerned about that and had to do a lot of research to make sure, and, and to blur things, and to make sure that, you know, I, I wasn't going to make my stuff, self look too, too uh, stupid here. And also, uh, physical things, you know, like bridges disappear, and they build new bridges and stuff when you leave town for a year or two, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so I had to get that, that stuff right, and that, that took a little work. So, you know, we're always in flux here in the States, so it's hard to do that. I've got one final question, but I'll let you guys go. Ahead, but I just want to let everybody know. I do want to, want everyone thinking. There's one final question I want to throw at you. With other characters in your story, characters change. They may not change, but usually your main character especially changes. Does your setting and how do you reflect that? Go ahead. I'm going to let 
I was going to throw out real quick about the historical side of what Rick was talking about. I have the absence problem. So things weren't invented yet by the, in the era of which that I was writing in, so I always have that kind of an issue. Yeah. But in which the, the setting changes, um, I, I think that depends. Um, you know, in, in Iron Horseman, uh, the, the setting definitely changes because there's a whole war that kind of takes place in London at the very end of the book. So London kind of gets torn up a lot. Um, you know, and, and when I move forward as I write the next book and stuff... I'll have to address that. I'll have to address either the rebuilding of London or the certain destruction of the areas. So yeah, I think setting can totally change, but I don't think it has to. I was going to ask how you can vague up setting details so that your story does not become dated dated very quickly <clears throat> because I've heard that publishing with major houses is like a two-year process. and mm -hmm. Leave things like, you know, pop culture references out. For the love of God, please. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be better off leaving them out anyway. Unlike, yeah. unlike what we do on White on Right Pike Radio, uh, leave them out. Okay. Uh -huh. um, well, I don't answer for the other question. I don't remember what it was. But going off of um, Kathleen's question, just kind of um, changing the names instead of using the name of a specific movie, a specific band or singer, just make up a generic one. I think can help hold because otherwise, like if you mention Taylor Swift and the book comes out like three years from now, we don't know if she's even going to be recording well, I mean, anymore. And it's... Taylor Swift is a great example, because if you mention her as a country singer, you had no yep. idea back in the day that she would turn into a bubblegum pop singer. True. Uh, well, I was just thinking in terms of like uh, your setting changing. Uh, during periods of upheaval in history is a great time to set your stories just as a uh, background. Uh, great example is the Wild West. Uh, the Wild West is a very specific period in between when uh, the settle civilization was coming into the West. It was landing on the trainways and building up and becoming like a civilized area, and it wasn't quite there yet. The law wasn't there yet, so it was still kind of open and free and wild. That's a very specific short time frame in the 1800s there, but it's rich with story. Exactly. Sure. But we talked about this on a previous episode. It's only a couple of decades long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you it know, doesn't and have then to you're be done. And you can't, if you want to try and play in the Old West, you have to put it in that little short time period because otherwise nobody's there. It's just, you know, Native Americans. Or the flip side is, you know, civilization has come and every city is now the same and the law is there and, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Just real quick, I remember what I was going to say, which is um, Lord of the Rings, the setting in probably at the end of Return of the King is probably very different. <laughs> Speaking of setting change... <laughs> Speaking of Sorry, change. I just wanted to play a bit of acoustic. It's very different yeah, than the way Middle-earth is back in The Hobbit because after the whole war and the scourging of the Shire and everything, just an example of a series where the world completely changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the Hunger Games. Or... No, yeah. Depending on the scale of your story, well, it doesn't even matter the scale of your story. Your setting has to change because, as humans, we have a direct effect on our environment. So, if anything meaningful has happened to your character, then it's going to be reflected in the people around them and the world around them and the decisions that they make, what they see, how they feel. And so, I think it's going to directly affect your environment. Excellent. So on that note, I'm going, to, well, I'm going to bring this to a close. I want to thank Rick for being here today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. It was fun. And to our audience out there, tune in next week for yet another interesting topic on writing and the publishing industry. The Write Back would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as a right pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.